Let's start closer to home, and I'm going to say unequivocally your Goldilocks zone is going to be bye-bye from this point forward. ADAPT 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Good evening and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James. Ah, myself, Stephen George. Good evening. We have a packed show. We lo- we've loads of information, loads of things to talk about. A great guest on. Our guest is David DeBoyne, and we're going to be talking about solar minimum and all. Why is the weather getting to be a very bad stage? Like last March, you know, about we had the beast from the east, and this summer was quite hot, and we're going to see more extremes going to be happening, and David's going to be telling us all about it. Yes, David is the creator of the Adapt 2030 channel on YouTube and Mini Ice Age Conversations podcast, which discuss societal, societal changes as our Earth enters uh, deeper into the Eddy Grand Solar Minimum, a 400-year cycle in our sun, which will affect everyone on our planet due to the never-ending food prices, rises and economic downturns. While acting as a coffee buyer in Myanmar's central Shan state, David noticed cold weather losses to new plantings, top leaf kill from frost and bean density decrease from below normal temperatures. With the grand solar minimum intensifying, we need to begin discussions on grain yield decreases, jet stream shifts, cloud cover increases with heavier wind and rain events which will bankrupt our industries, uh, create food shortages and crush the global economy as food prices triple by 2020 to 2021. With that said, where is your opportunity in these times of danger? Well, there you go. Good evening, David. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on again. This is going to be a great discussion to try to open some minds, really, as to the possibilities and the opportunities in front of you, as well as the danger. Definitely. Thanks a lot for coming on. Now, you were on our show last year, and um, but just so many changes in the weather, the climate change that we're experiencing at the moment. And just before we went live, we were talking about in Ireland, we had the, the beast from the east, which obviously affected Europe. And then our summer was quite extreme. And we've had Harry Rhodes uh, on the show who actually said that if you think that was bad, wait till the winter of 2018, 2019. So we're definitely going to a level of extremes. And we've had a, a number of people um, on Facebook and send an email saying, really looking forward to the interview tonight with David to find out what David has to say in his research and what he's found out. Because um, people are concerned, you know, I mean, really puts, for, for countries like Ireland and maybe the UK as well and various other countries, the climate is neither too bad or, or too good. It's kind of in between. It's the Goldilocks um, where we can manage a little bit of ice and a little bit of snow and then a few days of sun, and then it's kind of generally just grey in between. But now we're getting to extremes, and we really experienced it in March with that snow, um, which was pretty bad to beat from the east. And then the summer, uh, I mean, I enjoyed the weather, the summer, it's the first time we had a proper summer. But, you know, I know people start complaining that it was a bit too long. Now, there's reasons for this. So, I don't know, where do you want to kick off, David? Do you want to kind of bring us in and and tell us why this is happening and why this is getting more extreme? I would like to. And I say thank you so much for all of you out there that wanted me to come and talk today. That means a lot to me. I'm very grateful that you find my information so valuable that you're waiting for me to talk. Thank you for that. And also, let's just start with natural cycles first, because going into 400-year cycles in the sun, that's kind of the culmination of everything. But let's start closer to home, and I'm going to say unequivocally your Goldilocks zone is going to be bye-bye from this point forward. 
And this episode is brought to you by TrueLeafMarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds since 1974. Full range of garden seeds, microgreen seeds, sprouting seeds, wheatgrass, grain seeds, flower seeds, herb seeds, and ground cover crop. I encourage you to take a look at the website, trueleafmarket.com, and they even have free starter guides there for you to learn how to grow sprouts, microgreens, herbs, and wheatgrass. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. The 60-year cycle on the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, which is basically the Atlantic Ocean water temperatures. Now, regardless if there's a grand solar minimum or not, this 60-year cycle is responsible for the heating or the cooling over Europe. And also, the amount of cooler water or warmer water that would be pushed under the Arctic ice cap, and that's in a nine-year cycle. So I talk about cycles overlapping. Here we go. We have two different cycles overlapping on top of each other where there's a nine-year pulse water cycle. And then from this year forward, you're going to see a lot more ice depth and thickness and gain from this point forward, like we saw this year. You know, it's only the fifth least amount of ice and they're shocked by why it didn't go to all-time record low ice. Well, the water temperatures from the Atlantic up uh, south of Greenland, that cooler water is being pushed under the ice cap. So you got to think about it. In the 1990s, that water was at least 1.3 to 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than the last pulse. Now, this new pulse here is going to be a degree and a half or so Celsius below what it was in the 1990s. So you can expect, since it's cooler water from beneath, the melt from above and beneath is not happening any longer. So it happens at a slower rate, which means more ice will be there. Now, going on to the Atlantic water temperatures, that is set for its cooling phase for the next 30 years. Now, this would cool off Europe anyway. So if you take a look back and you go back into the 1930s, you'll start to see there was a peak in the Atlantic water temperatures, and then we had the Dust Bowl in the United States. We had really high temperatures globally. And then you just map it out every 60 years. Oh, wait, 1990s, that would have been another high. Extreme warm temperatures, just like it was in the 1930s, that is a natural cycle. And here we are, we are going to descend further, and these Atlantic water temperatures are going to continue to decrease. So that means where you are, your Goldilocks zone, you're going to have some brutal winters. And it was expected this year with the Farmer's Almanac and with the lineup of all these natural cycles cooling, and then you have the wild card of this grand solar minimum on top of that that only comes around once every 400 years. It lasts for about 15 years, and then it's gone. But what is the chance of that while the Atlantic's going cold that we get a grand solar minimum on top of that as well? It's really quirky, but expect cooler conditions across Europe, well, across the entire northern hemisphere. Right, okay. So, I mean, a lot of people of a certain age, and we would have remembered when we had extreme <clears throat> snow um, because March was very similar to 1982 when it was pretty bad. So I suppose if you do the maths, 1982, and then we had 19, 2018. So I don't know, what's that, 30 years, 40 years difference? Well, you should have worked that out before. 38 <laughs> years, something like that. Anyway, it's, it's a good while anyway. 38 years, give or take, you know. So obviously that's quite interesting. There's some kind of cycle there. The country just came to a standstill, didn't it, with the snow we just a lot yeah. of people just did you know weren't used to it because it was such a memory from 1982 at the time in 1982 i was living in dublin at the time and although it was bad we didn't see it as bad as it was being out in the country so difficult we were snowed in for about three days where we were living and um, so it was pretty bad so with the solar minimum happening how extreme when you say extreme are you talking about it's even going to be worse than what we had in march with this beast from the east that is my opinion, yes, along with many, many, many others, that you're going to go back to at least the 1970s cooling in this next winter. Because there was more sea ice and it's freezing faster now, that allows more wind patterns to drop further down south. Uh, the magnetosphere has weakened even since last year, which allows these jet streams to dip even further. So these polar vortexes, what they're going to be looking for is a new phenomenon, and I am calling it right now. Mm. The polar vortex, which you're used to, are those tongues from the Arctic that dip really far south. It was dipping even down into northern Africa and Morocco with the record snow and cold and record snow and cold across Algeria. And it even went down into Saudi Arabia with record cold and snow last year in that last winter you're referring to in the Beast of the East winter. This year, 
Those troughs are going to go lower. They're going to extend further toward the equator, and they're expecting what would be called a break-off, and it would turn into a cold bubble that is going to migrate across into tropical zones, but Arctic air trapped in its little bubble. Because the tropospheric temperatures, are, it's going to create its own bubble of cold that will break off of that um, polar vortex, and it will keep going south and just freeze out places that have never been frozen. It will be kind of like a fizzy bubble that goes off the, the main uh, vortex there, and it will spin out. And it's going to have a lot of problems. And the cold is going to continue to amplify. We talked about timelines earlier. This is going to be what is considered the beginning of the amplification this winter that we're going to begin to experience over the next few months. This is it. We're at the cusp of all the changes that are here. Now, what, and I'll say this is very, very solid information. This winter that you experience, the following two winters will be at least double or triple as ferocious and fierce with the amount of winds, temperatures, and snow that will accompany. So you'll get a very good gauge of what the future weather will be like for whatever region you're in across the planet. It just does not have to be where you're at or where I'm at. Okay. Whatever the winters will be like, expect more amplification on that in terms of cold, wind, uh, power outages, and everything. Okay, let me talk to you about this polar vortex. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of refer to Hollywood, but and you know what, Hollywood exaggerates things. But the movie The Day After Tomorrow, they talked about, in that movie, they talked in polar vortex. And even through, they, they've had, uh, they've dug up mammoths where they've actually said there must have been an instant freeze where the food was still in their stomach. They hadn't digested it. Now, I know when we see in extreme weather, I think last year there was people on uh, video and it was like minus 35 in certain parts of the States. It came down from from the Arctic and people were opening the window and it was just like, I mean, severe cold. You could see it coming in. But this polar vortex um, that you're talking about, I mean, how low are we going to go temperature wise? What would you be talking about? Well, the same as last year, minus 5C probably, something 3 to 5C cooler than the lowest temperatures. So what I would say equivalent is all the record cold temperatures that were set last year, they're going to be broken again this year in those same exact spots because it seems that it's just a cycle. And when you look back through history, you can find where some player areas on the planet, specifically the, uh, France, central France and Germany, that area is always the first to cool in these cycles. And, you know, you can just – trace it back in history. And if I could add one thing about what you talked about with the uh, mammoths here. Now, the polar vortex, that's just cold air on our planet's surface. Mm -hmm. What uh, apparently had happened to the mammoths was there was an area, a hole that opened up from the troposphere in our upper atmosphere and drove down and down that extreme cold straight to our planet. So it was almost like uh, a space cold air tornado, if you will, coming down and touching our planet on, a, on in certain areas because it had to be about 180 below zero or something to freeze those mammoths at that point. And just on Earth, we just don't get to that temperature, not even down in Antarctica in the middle of the winter. So it had to be been a, a space weather event that caused that to happen. So they're quite different in the ferocity and how cold it really got. Because mammoths, you know, they're, they're used to living in zero or below zero. You ever see those woolly coats on them, the thickness of their skin? They're, used, they're, they're built for that. Elk are, too. And last year, I don't know if it was a cold plasma event. Sorry, two, two years ago, it was a cold plasma event. Or what happened, but full-on herd of 30 elk just got frozen solid, just like the mammoths in an instant. So what happened there? Was that another tropospheric anomaly where that tropospheric temperatures and actual really cold space temperatures dropped to our Earth in sort of a tornado fashion, and they're not, trying not to tell people because they spook people with cold plasma events reaching our Earth's surface? That is a spooky thing to think about. That is, uh, that is spooky. I'd, I'd like to know, trivia pursuit question, what is the coldest Ireland has ever been recorded? Not the wind chill factor, but actually just from a cold point of view. I'd like to know if anybody knows or anybody can Google that. What what is the lowest recorded temperature in Ireland that's ever been recorded? That would be interesting to find out because um, we might be going down that road. I know if it gets really cold. I know when it's cold because Steve will put on another T-shirt. <laughs> 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 I love t-shirts um, it says here just, just uh, to answer your question the lowest temperature was minus 19.1 degrees and that was in January 16th of January 1881 minus 19 what do you think of that David do you think we're going to go lower than that now 
maybe not this year, but probably by 2023 or 2024, I would put my reputation out to say yes. Okay. Now, with these extremes, with the winter and what we're going to experience, does that flip for the summer? It does, and you've already started to see that. Mm. I've been terming it the equatorial vortex versus the polar vortex, you know, mm. coming from two different latitudes on the planet here. So it's the exact same phenomenon, just happening in reverse from where the air streams or when the jet streams are originating from. So we've seen some amazing cold in the winter time, where that Arctic air went all the way down to Florida, went down to Cuba last year. You know, and it went way down into North Africa. But we're starting to see the same thing where this equatorial vortex is pushing that really warm air with those same vortices, but really far up to Norway like we saw this year. And uh, it seems to be extremes in both. It seems that these vortices are able to push much further out of their normal ranges because when our atmosphere is locked in place, when the magnetosphere is nice and strong because our, our sun's magnetic field is nice and strong and it's connected with our Earth's magnetic field, you know, these two bodies in space are connected electromagnetically. We're not just revolving around by our own uh, just a little ball in space, then our magnetic field just spins off into nothingness. No, 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 no. This thing is connected to the sun. So whatever happens on the sun affects our Earth. Now, our magnetosphere, that, you know, that is what locks our atmosphere in. And when it's nice and tight like it was in the 1990s, those jet streams stayed in their exact same positions. There was very little difference in how far north or south they went out of their traditional flow. But since we are getting into a very weak magnetosphere, these jet streams are able to flow wherever they want. And you're really seeing the amplification of, I'm, I don't even know, are these things going to blaze down to something like 20 degrees north latitude or even further, 15 degrees north latitude when it gets to the apex of this cooling? That I am not sure of. But they talked about the Everglades. This is for American audience uh, and the Everglades in America. This is southern Florida down near Miami. Froze every winter for eight winters straight. And the Native American Seminole Indians called it the Great White Rain because it snowed in southern Florida every year. And the Everglades had a glaze of ice on them where they were able to walk over the Everglades covered by ice. This is accounts of the Native American Indians, Seminoles, in 1600s. Wow. The, um, I will say, obviously, we know there's a change going on, and we're seeing it here in Ireland, because we're experiencing weather patterns that we haven't experienced before. And we've had Hurricane Ophelia. And we just had a hurricane, uh, Florence, and we were down last week. I was down for two days. Steve was as well, and um, with power. And we are experiencing weather patterns now. We have heard on um, just people talk about the pole shift, and the pole shift is happening. And we know the magnetic poles are changing because the airports are changing their runways because of the magnetic poles are changing. But there is a physical shift happening as well. Now, one of the books that um, I read. Uh, a book called The Only Planet of a Choice. I've mentioned it on the on the show before. And they talk about, obviously, the Earth being now a, now a kilter by about 23.5 degrees. And that pole shift is about moving it back to zero degrees. And when that happens, apparently we're going to have a, a global temperate climate. But, you know, obviously that shift has to take place. And that's happening now, so we've been told. But it's going to take time. And that's why we're seeing a lot of changes maybe teutonic plate movements as well are happening and since i have been talking about our need moving forward in this new society that we're entering as our global grain production starts to be reduced in yield your food prices are going to skyrocket and i mean skyrocket not just doubling or tripling something like five or ten times higher by 2020 at the very least trueleafmarket.com i really want to talk about Growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. They've been around since 1974. Heirloom and organic seeds. You know, since I've started talking about them in my videos, I have a lot of people write and say that they've previously ordered, that they know the owner, having great results, good customer service. They quite enjoyed the seed quality as well. And there's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. And we know the benefits of microgreens. All you have to do is use a search engine and look up vitamin, mineral, nutrient content of microgreens. You'll be shocked. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? 
How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. And not only that, they have wheatgrass and grain seeds. So what I'm talking about grain growing regions going offline, we just need to look back in history and see where across the planet there was difficulty growing grains when this grand solar minimum intensified and the jet stream started wandering just like they're doing today due to a decreased magnetosphere that does not hold our jet streams locked in their traditional flows. Grains are one thing, herb seeds are another, cover crops, something different, but whatever you do, organic seeds are going to be a necessity because you can save those seeds and then grow them the next season, which you unequivocally cannot do with GMO. Trueleavemarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. In my personal opinion, the USGS and global monitoring systems for earthquakes are an all-out effort to downgrade these quakes so you don't see the uptick in large quakes because that is one of the things that goes with this grand solar minimum is more tectonic activity, more volcanic activity, and larger earthquakes. And there's a lot of people talking about the correlation between what's happening with the uptick in the quakes and the uptick in the volcanoes across the planet Yet, with the numerals and the numbers that are put there for the quakes, it seems that they're downgrading on purpose so you don't see the linear trend up. Because to downgrade a quake by six-tenths, or that's crazy when it was a 7.7, and they want to put it down to 6.9. Then they had all these aftershocks of like 6.7, 7.1, 6.8, and they're all downgraded into 5.9 or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous, really. I just don't get it, but there's something they're trying to hide. Yeah, well, there is something. I think there is because they've been caught out a few times doing that. You know, um, I couldn't believe it. And there's obviously something going on to affect it that much. Maybe it's part of the pole shift. I don't know. But we were having extreme flooding, um, extreme weather patterns, extreme conditions. So we have to get ready for this. And later on in the show, we're going to be talking about solutions and what we can do to prepare and get ready. Um, because if we're going to, for the next 15 years, um, and 10 to 15 years, if this is going to get to extremes, both hot and cold, we need to get prepared and we need to get ready because everybody experienced the beast from the east. Mm. And I don't know anybody that actually liked it. Okay, for the first, you know, you know, the snow, the kids like the snow, but when you can't get out to go to the local shop to get food and your your stocks are running low, you know, that's when you realise, I think that was for me, I don't know about you, Steve, that's when we realised how important it is to be prepped, to get oh, ready and have a, have a prep. Absolutely, because yeah, I mean, yeah, when, when that happened, even in our village, I mean, uh, you know where, where a local shop is, uh, it would normally take, if you were to walk to it, you could walk to it in five minutes. And after that, that downpour uh, of the snow, we, after day Day, after day two, like our stocks were starting to run a little bit low, and we also wanted to go around and check on, on the in-laws as well. So a five-minute, which would normally be a five-minute trek to the shop, shop uh, took about 30 minutes, which was ridiculous, you know, because yeah. you, you're going into the snow and your, your leg muscles are getting tired and all this mm-hmm. carry on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if that's going to happen again and, and worse, to get we, we, need, we need to get prepared. and we need. I mean, people people need to know this information. Definitely. And that's why we need, you know, David, this is great information that we can get, let our listeners know to get prepared, especially if we're in Ireland and the UK and Europe as well. Um, now, the whole idea, we did mention uh, before uh, the show about the Carrington effect. Uh, for people who don't know the Carrington effect, it's something that happened in 1859 where it was a, a coronal mass ejection and had a massive effect on the planet and it blew out all the telegraph poles. Now, because we didn't have electronics, um, it didn't matter. A few people, a couple of people got electrocuted, all right, because of there was, there was basic electricity there. Um, but it wasn't a major issue because people were self-sufficient at that time in 1859. However, this day and age, I mean, we were down for two days and, you know, just for two days last week and we were going... You know, okay, we got a lot of things done, but we just imagined that was a week. So, what's the possibility? Now, we did hear that there was um, a new miss in 2012 regarding a CME. Um, what's the possibility of something like that happening? Because I'll tell you why, David. We also, somebody else said that the, the Ring of Fire, which is the Pacific, 
there was something like 77 volcanoes gone off all at the same time. And some people believe, I don't know how true this is, that that will actually cause a magnetic pulse effect from the volcanoes and actually have an effect on the sun, which might cause something like a CME or something similar. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, personally, I think it would be the opposite. The sun would affect the earth first to cause that. Now, it could be a static discharge release in the atmosphere if there was enough ash up there. But for us to affect the sun, usually it's the opposite way around because the sun's about 1.2 million times larger than our earth. Although it is known, though, with our iron cores, we go around. It seems that when we get to in front of some of these sunspots that they just seem to dissipate. Now, could that be something? Obviously, they're looking into it. There's a lot of study going on to see what effect our Earth has passing in front of sunspots that magically make them disappear. Now, is that a protective type of a thing? Will that has, have less of an effect of dissipating sunspots as our magnetosphere uh, weakens along with the sun's magnetic field? Those are to be knowns. But just to come at it from the non-fear factor, I want to set uh, just of those of you listening that you were talking about the pole shift there, it's called polar wander. Now, it's not a full-on shift happening at the moment. It's a wander, which means that the the magnetic north pole is moving around. Now, it's been moving around since the 1600s that they've been categorizing it and following its movement. It'll go, it'll clip off one direction uh, for 250 miles, and it'll pull back another direction 200 miles, and it'll zip somewhere else 300 miles. This time, it's continued to go in its direction toward Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, and it's continuing to speed up at around 45 miles per year. Now, you need to think about that because one degree latitude is 60 miles. So even if you're talking, let's talk about where you're at up there, where the cold is. If I go down somewhere into Spain, that difference in how many miles north or south is, that is a gargantuan difference in the climate that you're getting. So think about that. If the pole's been moving for five, six, seven years now in that same direction and we're something like 300 miles or 350 miles difference from what it was, think about your own local climates wherever you are. And if you go 350 miles further south or further north, how different the climate would be. And, you know, this could all be part of it, why the animals are having a difficult time migrating around and they're, you know, 350 miles that direction, it was open ocean, and then suddenly they're running onto a peninsula. You just have to think about some of these uh, magnetic changes. And, you know, I'm going to use 350 to 400 miles as my baseline because that's how much the, the pole has moved toward Kamchatka Peninsula. And, and that would be what, uh, five, six degrees of latitude more, eight degrees of latitude, something in there. That is a lot of movement. This video is brought to you by our friends at TrueLeafMarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet – 